Hey, got a dollar? What? Give me your fucking money. Hey! <coughs> hey, Cindy. Hey, got a dollar? What? Give me your fucking what? wallet. Hey! <coughs> you okay? Yeah, come on. <coughs> Hi, I'm Kathy Long. I'm sure by now you've seen dozens of self-defense videos where somebody throws a punch at you or grabs you by the wrist and you do a series of self-defense moves. Well, today I'm going to teach you how to attack somebody if you need to. Let's get started. Hey, got a dollar? What? Give me your fucking money. Hey! <coughs> hey, Cindy. <coughs> Hey, got a dollar? What? Give me your fucking what? wallet. Hey! <coughs> you okay? In this section, I'm attacking the predator from behind. So if I'm going to attack somebody from behind, I want to make sure that I've got some distance. If he's aware of me at all, he might come back with an elbow or he might step forward and turn at me. But I want to make sure that I'm here. So when I kick him into the hollow of the knee, I want to buckle his knee but not drive it down to the ground. And the reason I want to buckle his knee is to bring his face to my level so that I can then grab him by the eyes. And when I grab him by the eyes, I'm actually sticking my fingers in his eyes and driving his head down by his eyes. Okay. As I'm doing it, I'm raking down. So when I'm here, buckle the knees, grab the eyes like this. Drive his head down. Okay. If, his palm, if his face is available, palm it. It probably won't be because he's grabbing his eyes. Generally, the body reacts away from pain, and the hands usually go to the area that's hurt. So in this case, if I want to hit him in the face, it's not going to be available to me because he's holding his eyes. I might, I might instead stand up and stomp on his chest or stomp on his solar plexus. Hey, Jimbo here. I've got an awesome free YouTube giveaway for the first 200 guys. It's our world famous five in one survival knife with five very useful functions, including a ferrocerium metal rod to quickly ignite a fire without matches, a super reliable LED flashlight that's shockingly bright, a glass breaker, a belt cutter that actually works, and of course, a razor sharp knife. And right now, with your permission, I will rush you this amazing five in one survival knife for free. Just pay shipping and handling, and it's on its way to your front door. But get to the link in the description now if you want one. Now, in this particular scenario, my wife and I are going to be going into a bar. As we enter the bar, we're going to see a couple drunk bad guys coming out. They give us the eyeball. We see it from about 20, 30 feet away. We decide not to engage. We're looking like we're gonna turn around. At that point, I look at my wife and I say, hey, better get out your knife. Now, whether you choose to carry a knife with you is up to you. In my opinion, it is the perfect equalizer for a woman, for a man, okay? It is the perfect equalizer. So in a scenario like this, it would be very difficult to fight two on two with your wife. If she has a knife, there's no problem. So you're gonna see her pull the blade. We're gonna try to avoid the conflict. They're gonna cut us off. We can't avoid it. We're forced to fight. She'll use her blade. I'll use my empty hands. Hopefully everything will turn out okay. Now, what could have been a potential disaster was averted because my wife had a knife. Had she have not had a knife, I would have had to have confronted both people and tried to protect her at the same time. So this is the advantage of carrying around an equalizer. I highly recommend you A, learn how to use it, and B, carry it. Is that we are stuck in an environment, in a situation that we don't want to be in. Ground fighting, mass attack, 
uh, somebody pulls a blade on you. These are situations that are absolutely the worst case scenarios. So what we need to do is we need to not fight things head on. We need to circumvent the odds. We need to find a way to get an equalizer. So when you have to fight more than one person, there are different scenarios. One scenario is that you have space. We're gonna address that one first. Later on, we're gonna address the scenario where you have to fight more than one person and you do not have the latitude of having this much space. So we're gonna start off with a two-on-one. We're not gonna throw any blows and I want you to see the mindset of how you fight two people. And that mindset is that you don't fight two people, you fight one person. Kinda of like an eclipse. You wanna keep one person here, the assailant behind them, and you want yourself here. The last thing you wanna do is rush down the middle of two people. So you wanna keep an I as opposed to a T formation. Okay, guys, come on out. Now again, we're not throwing any punches. I just want you to see the footwork. Notice the movement and the footwork, the perpetual zoning. Okay, ready? Go. And break. Good. Now, if you noticed, I had one of my assailants always behind the other, where I wasn't fighting two people at the same time. Then from there, once you have that established, then you can throw in your blows, your punching, your headbutt, your knees, and your elbows. You first have to get the footwork down. Hey, second notice about the awesome giveaway I'm doing right now for the first 200 guys who respond. Get to the link in the description and I will rush you our stunning new five-in-one survival knife for free. Just pay shipping and handling and it's on its way to your front door. This is a $65 five-function survival knife, flashlight, fire starter, glass breaker, belt cutter, and of course, a razor sharp knife. Total quality, there's a strict limit of 200 to go around. So get to the link in the description now. Recently, I've been doing a little personal inventory and research on what people's fears were, as I've discussed so many times already. One of the bigger fears is the push and punch, the guy that bull rushes you. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of people that, what about the guy that just throws that big looping right hand? And I tell you, a lot of people don't know how to defend that right hand. Now, if you jump up inside of those guys with our, you know, with our crash positions and our elbows, that's gonna work for you pretty well, okay? But I'm gonna run three scenarios by you that I think work really well and kind of shutting down that right hand just a little bit. So what I'll do is ask Roger to come back in and join us. All right, so Roger, okay. The first thing we're gonna do is when the right hand comes is, if they, most people don't throw a straight right hand. They, they kind of loop and wing it. It's just the way it comes off in the street. Like I said, let it, let it come to you. Let the hand come to you. We're already in our crash position, but this time, in addition to that, what I'm gonna do is go right inside the bicep, right in here. You've got, you've got a series of nerves, and these are very sensitive. And you'll probably see Roger react a little bit to this, but it, it creates a lot of pain. So it's almost a block and a punch that go at the same time. I throw my hands up, let the, let the punch come to me. I twist, turn my body, and I'm physically gonna corkscrew my, my knuckles right into his bicep. So when Roger does that, I do this. Bang, go ahead and speed up the punch. He comes in and we hit. So he can't even stay in there, right? As soon as we hit it, it's gonna sting him really bad. It's gonna cause a stinger. Then my elbow is already blocked and in case he decides to throw the other hand. And I've got the elbow, the bit slap, the other elbow and face, okay? So once again, he, he, he fires that right hand, bang. Elbow, hammer fist in this case. It's whatever's there. That hammer fist is really setting him into a knee. Just because and you're going to have to learn through your training where the guy ends up. It's like playing chess, right? He comes in, bang. Each scenario is a little bit different. Bang, back of the neck, knee. You know, push him to the ground. One more time. I'm going to work it from the other angle. Same thing. Comes in. I let it come to me. And at the same time, I'm corkscrewing the bicep. Just twist, turn my body like this, right? So as he comes in, bang, elbows here in case he decides to rush me. And then it's gonna be pop, bang, slap. Okay, if he does that and gets underneath of me, I'm gonna sprawl and watch my legs. This way you start putting things together during your training session. You got two people. 
If I don't remember what to do. I've, I've done this, and he's all, he's going to say, hey, Jim, choke me or hit the back of my head or knee me, but don't let me grab your legs. You know, we work with each other, okay? And, and that's the way you learn. It, it, it eventually becomes very natural just feeling where the guy is, but you've got to know where you're going in the beginning. He throws the right hand, block. And remember, when you block it, you're protecting your jaw. Usually these elbows and these fists are going to take care of it. I can slap him right in the face like that. You know what that's going to do? That's going to shoot his head back and I'm going to get me some throat. All right? That's uh, one of the ways that I, I've envisioned stopping a right hand. If he was a left-handed guy and he throws, bang, same thing. <laughs> Those faces are for real. This stuff is very painful. Hold your hand like that and let your buddy just hit you right here. It hurts, guys. It will stop you dead in your tracks. All right? into our ground fighting and our uh, grappling techniques. Number one, we have what's called covering. This is when the enemy is acting first and we're responding to his attack. He may throw a right cross, but based on the distance, I might just bring those hands up right in front of my face to protect myself. It's a very reflexive and instinctive action. So when it comes straight in at me, I'm just going to pick those hands up and I'm going to let that thing, I'm going to let that attack just land on my arms. I'm just trying to protect my face. Second thing we have is if he throws like a left or a wide left hook, I'm just going to bring my hand up and I'm just going to cover. But just like when we're shooting, I'm going to keep my eyes on him. I'm going to flinch. That's a reflexive. That's a very natural response. But what I'm going to try to do is I'm watching his torso and I'm watching where that next attack is going to where that next attack is going to come because it is going to come. And I'm going to grab and get control. So again, when that left hook comes in or that left attack, I'm going to cover. And I'm just, I'm just getting my arm in the way, a meaty portion of my arm in the way, so that when he hits, he's going to hit my arm. He's not going to hit me. And I've already predetermined that's the secondary attack that's coming in, and I'm waiting for it to show up. And this is when I'm responding to him. Now, if he's to show, uh, throw a, uh, a right hook to, this, to the left side of my body, I'm going to cover the same thing. I'm going to cover up. I'm waiting for that secondary attack. It's going to show up, and that's when we're going to start grabbing. It's a very instinctive and... Uh, reflexive response. Second thing is called what, what I call riding, and it builds on the covering positions. So he may throw a, a jab and a cross or any kind of combination, and I'm going to respond to it. What riding is, I'm just going to drop my hand somewhere near his shoulders. I can grab his shirt, or I can just kind of monitor and hold on to it. But while, while he's continuing his attack, because I'm still thinking defensively, I'm just going to ride, basically. I'm going to ride out, or I'm going to ride this out for a minute, while he's throwing so I can collect my thoughts and so that I can kick into my trained responses. So as he starts to throw his punches, I'm just gonna monitor his hands, keeping my head down between my arms so that I can control him and monitor and, and relax a little bit, get through the reflexive and instinctive responses so that I can start kicking into my trained responses and I can go on the offensive. And finally, controlling. When those, when those punches come in, okay, and I cover up, a lot of times, number one, I may want to just gain control of him and hold on to him for a minute and kind of work with him and ride this out and watch for secondary threats just so that I can collect my thoughts. But I'm controlling him in a way that he's not able to really do me a lot of physical harm. Okay? We can control on the high line and grab a hold of him, move him around and start looking. Okay? And we can also control him on the low line. High punches. Okay, where he might hit, but I'm going to come in. I'm going to drop in. I'm going to duck my head in. And if you notice my right hand, I'm pulling his body into me. And I'm controlling, this is, this is the tool that's gonna hurt me. So I'm pulling that into my body. Another position which has become increasingly popular is for me to take both hands and just wrap them in and hold on to him. Okay, and just bend my knees and get to where I can control his body. And I need to look at where those other threats are at until when I break away and I start going back on the offensive. But the purposes of these and so when I get a control of him, I can collect my thoughts because the first, the first, the coverings, the writings, the initial withdrawal and uh, cross extensive reflexes are just that. They're instinctive responses, they're reflexive responses that I can't control. So when they come in, okay, number one, I can ride. Okay, if I can't, if I'm losing the battle here, I can control him and we're moving around. Remember I told you about the basketball footwork. We're moving around and if I have to gain control, I may just gain control and hold on to him and ride this out until I can actually make a conscious decision to fight back and put him back on the defensive.
Hey, final chance at getting a free five-in-one survival knife. This is a $65 gadget with five functions, and it's yours for free. Just pay shipping and handling to get this to your front door, and I'll rush one out to you right away. I started with only 200. There are still some left, so get to the link in the description while you can. I'll see you over there. The ability to defend yourself, you got to think of it as a symphony and not individual notes or, or you know, phrases. Because people and situations are fundamentally unpredictable, and that is a reality you must accept. They're fundamentally unpredictable. The only thing you have control with is you. So in any encounter, just with two people, only 50% of this is, is moderately under your control. The other 50% is out of your control. That means that you cannot predict exactly what, when, how it's going to happen. That's not up to you. It's up to the attacker. So a lot of people go, well, you know, I've got, uh, I don't need to learn unarmed techniques or self-defense, hand-to-hand uh, -hand self-defense because I've got my gun or just fill in the blank. I've got my knife and I don't need to learn it. Well, that's really short-sighted and it's naive because they're assuming that, uh, most people assume that the actual uh, fight that actually occurs in the real world is going to resemble something that they've seen. Most people are educated by movies and television, right? Got to remember, that's scripted. The whole point of a movie and television show is to tell a story. So they lead up to it. Even if there's a surprise thing, they lead up to it and then you get to walk through the whole encounter. It doesn't happen that way. You know, it, even our perception, it doesn't happen that way. Violence is sudden. It's, even if it's uh, an escalation, most people are completely unprepared for the uh, brutality of it and the suddenness of it. So you may or may not be able to access that weapon, that gun or that knife, on a tactical level, right? In other words, you may be able to get to it, you may not. Most of the time, you probably won't. Let's take a female, for example. So she's carrying pepper spray or whatever else she's carrying, and it's in her purse. Well, it's at least two steps action away. And so you're assuming that if somebody grabs her or chokes her or is going to punch her in the face, that in the time between he decides to punch you in the face, then you're going to suddenly reach down, access your purse, open it up, grab the pepper spray, pull it out, flip the nozzle to make it the safety off, turn it and get it into his face before he punches you or grabs you or yanks your hair or takes you to the ground. It's completely naive and foolish. All right? Now, if you're smart and you're aware of those type of things, okay, yeah, you can turn around. We have confrontation management techniques and we have threat perception techniques in which we, you maximize your ability to recognize the threat instantly. There's mental switches that I teach people to keep off most of the time, but when something happens to you, you flip those switches on really, really fast and you react. And that can help you get up to speed very quickly. But it's no guarantee that you're not going to have an explosive jump out of the bushes type of situation. So it's naive to think that any weapon of any type is going to affect you. That's why I always tell people, it's not the weapon, that's a tool. You're the weapon. So when I'm teaching this course or any other course that I'm teaching, it's always about you. You are the weapon, not this. This is an implement that you may or may not be able to use. Is it smart to learn it? You're damn right it's smart to learn it. It's smart to gain as much knowledge as you possibly can about this type of stuff. Going back to the same principle, I never know when, what, how, why I'm going to be attacked. I may need, precisely need, this tool to save my life. Let's talk about some of the things that are important before we actually get into the techniques and tactics. The first thing we have to do is talk about legal moral justification. Now, I want to start off and say this right off the bat, that everything I'm teaching you in this video, we're assuming that it's legally and morally justified. In other words, you're in the right. All right? So how do we know that? How do we understand that? So years ago, I used to study law, and I was very frustrated because when I would travel all over the world, I've been to more than 30 countries, and you go there and you, the laws are different everywhere you go. Even though the basic, you know, common sense principle of self-defense exists everywhere, uh, how you can deploy that and how you can get in trouble, more importantly, is, is different everywhere you go. Even from state to state or municipality to municipality, let alone country to country. So it occurred to me that there needs to be a method, a kind of a universal concept that we can use in order to keep ourselves on the right side of the law. And I think it's very valuable to tell you this right now. So one of the things we teach is what we call the legal moral survival triad. It's really simple. Three words. Avoid. 
escape, resist, preferably in that order, never violate it. So the idea is that if you need to try to avoid the conflict entirely. So you're walking down the street and you're, you know, in front of you people are arguing or people throwing bottles, turn the hell around and go the other direction. Right? Something explodes or some, you know, what we call JDLR. Something just doesn't look right. A person, a place, a thing, whatever it is, doesn't look right. Get out of there. Your first instinct would avoid contact with it entirely. That's the smartest way to deal with it. And that's the first thing you should always do. Try to avoid it. Now, if you can't avoid it, and it happens suddenly, because violence happens often explosively uh, or escalating. Sometimes it's so explosive that it's kind of a jump out of the bushes type of thing. Well, I can't avoid that. Here I am. So your next priority is always to escape this situation, to get out of it. And if you truly try to escape, it means take every escape route you can. Run, jump a fence, get in a car, do whatever you can to get away. Because resistance is the last option you should have. Now, how does this work for you legally and morally? Works well because think about it for a second. If I can actually say that I did everything I could to avoid this conflict, in other words, I saw it coming and I steer cleared of it, that means I walked away and then they came after me, suddenly, in the eyes of the law, they are, by definition, predators. All right, if I walked out the door and they came after me trying to hurt me, they're the predators, not me. Second, if I got to that point and I literally tried to take every escape route I possibly could, went out every door, and they still came after me, they're mega predators at that point in the eyes of the law. And if I use resistance as the last option, I have those two buffers to help me legally and morally, regardless of what the laws may be wherever you are. The problem is most people don't do this. Either they're not aware or they don't pay attention or they're too macho or whatever else, they can't, they don't leave, they don't avoid it. So take my word for it. You're going to have to defend yourself twice. Once against an attacker or attackers, and once again against attacking attorneys or laws that are coming after you to justify your actions. So be smart. Try to avoid it, try to escape it, and use resistance as the last option. Avoid, escape, and resist. Okay, so avoiding is steering clear. And like I said, you may have to use that paranoia switch. That's the first thing you do. Can I avoid this conflict? Flicks off, he's gonna come at me, he doesn't. Okay, okay, can I, can I avoid it? What is avoiding me? Sorry man, don't have a watch. Even if you got a watch on, you don't have a watch. Walk away, right? Okay, next, okay, if, if that person follows you, right? I'm walking away, he's following me, right? And I turn around and say he's following me, what changed? One thing changed. The potential for him to be a predator. If he had evil intent, okay, and he was coming after me, that's exactly what he's going to do. He's not going to let you go, right? And the moment you took the step backwards, you put yourself in a better position in the eyes of the law than you would if you had stepped forward and said, hey, what's your problem, right? Always avoid it. And when you can't avoid it, the second word is escape. Escape simply means, okay, he's still coming. How do I get out of here? What exit do I have to take? Do I use confrontation management? Just, hey, man, just leave me alone. Calm down. I don't want any trouble with you. Back out the room, right? It could mean, holy crap, he, he's got a knife. Uh, you know what? This isn't worth it. Today I'll run away and to fight another day. And I just turn around and jog away, okay? Or sprint if you have to. But the point is you escape it. Take every possible door, every escape route. That's your next goal. Avoid it if you can. If you can't and there's a possible conflict, don't be stupid. Don't fight if you don't have to. And God forbid, pull something like this when you don't have to. You always do if you have to. Because you're going to have to defend yourself two times, most likely, in this world. Uh, particularly with all the cameras out. Everybody's filming everything. So you better realize that, imagine that this is always on film which is even worse than 20 years ago when you could just, my word against them. Now it's somebody shooting it somewhere, or there's a security camera somewhere. So you better damn well be in the right. Avoid it, escape it, and go out every escape route. Now, how do you look in the eyes of the law? Let's say that it happened in a, in a building, and I left, walked outside. They came out in the parking lot with me, and they still are, are threatening me. They say, man, I, want, I need five bucks. Give me five bucks, damn it. You, you can give me five bucks. You got a nice watch. Come on, give me five bucks. You back up, say, pal, I'm not going to give you anything. Just relax, leave me alone. You back around the car. They come around the car, okay? So you freaking do whatever you can. Let's say 
I go to the extreme. He's cornered me against the car and the wall. I jump over the car hood. Now I'm over there. Now, how does the law look at you? What happens when you get in court? The jury's going to go, damn, he jumped over that car to get away from this guy. Right? And as long as you do that to the best of your ability, you put yourself in a, in a tremendously great position regardless of the law, regardless of whether you're in England or you're in Australia or you're in the United States. You've already this, this have manifested a situation in which he is becoming a predator and you're becoming a defender. And that changes the whole aspect. It, 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 it mitigates all of the individual laws of when you can and when you can and what you should say and, you know, whatever. That's the whole idea. So then you've got void, escape, resist. Resistance definitely has caveats with it. You can't just say at this point, you know, you come to me and I'm cornered, okay, then I turn into a, a tornado and I rip you all apart and turn you into diced hamburger. At that point, you know, you still have to have some common sense connected to resistance. Resistance not only should be your last option, it should be mitigated by, um, and I don't want to say control. Um, I want to say um, smart effectiveness. Okay, in other words, uh, we teach people in my system that the primary form of resistance is to get to the hit. Hit them as fast as and hard as you can. No hesitation. Once they cross the line, and now it's you know they're a predator, and this, or they attack me, or someone I love, or my wife, or something else, they cross the line. At that point, I am going to turn into a human buzzsaw, and I'm going to take you out. We have what's called a nine-second rule. The nine-second rule says that if you're in a real fight, not in the ring, not sparring, not screwing around, you're in a real fight, and it lasts longer than ten seconds, you're doing something really wrong. Or you're, chase, or you're against big odds, three or four people, or somebody who's freaking great, or whatever. So, and how often is that going to happen? It's rarely ever going to happen. So you're dealing with average people. So in nine seconds, I'm going to demolish my attacker, and that's what we train our people to do. Why? Because you don't throw a punch and step back and see if it worked. Because an injured bear is more dangerous than, a, than an unconscious bear, right? So that's one problem, and the other problem is, you know, if I hit them and they do this and, they, and then I come back again, I realize, oh my God, it didn't work quite well. And then I go back. We just changed the dynamic legally. Now all of a sudden, people, even though they might not understand the urgency of this fight, what they're going to say is, uh, you know, why didn't you just stop right there? Right? And then you've negated the avoid, escape, resist thing because now when you come back, it looks like revenge. It looks like a, I'm the predator now. And though, even though you did all the things in before, you overdid the resistance. So I'm a big fan of completely wiping somebody out, and I'm not mean murdering them or killing them or turning them. I'm doing whatever is necessary, whatever is necessary level of force. If it's deadly force, it does mean killing them. I will kill them in a heartbeat to protect someone I love, right? If it's not deadly force, it means causing enough pain, speed, shock, and surprise, hit them so hard that you dismantle their nervous system, you cause enough pain and damage that they're incapable of continuing their assault on you. But we do it in as fast as humanly possible. In reality, you may not be able to do that. There may be breaks. Things you may, you know, something falls or something falls around something and he comes at you again. That's a different story. But the truth is that's the premise. That's the idea. And if you follow those things, avoid, escape, and resist, you will be in the best possible light. It's a universal principle that I created to circumvent all the different nuances of the law. So remember that. Thanks for watching our video lessons here at TRS Direct. Hit the like button down below and consider subscribing to our channel here on YouTube. Hit the bell icon and we'll send you a notification when there's a new lesson available. Thanks again for watching.